Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing thrombosis and the antithrombotics. Okay, so we've done quite a few drugs now and we're now studying the anticoagulants. So we're beginning with heparin, okay? We'll then go on to warfarin and uh, dabigatran and rivaroxaban. Okay, right. Uh, so we're beginning with heparin though. Okay, so. Um, we have discussed that um, the liver is producing this protein known as antithrombin-3, okay? And antithrombin-3, by the way, is what's known as a serpin, okay? And serpin stands for serine protease inhibitor. So should I try and squeeze this in here? Serine protease inhibitor. And this is a little protein which can inhibit serine proteases, surprisingly. Okay, and all of the um, coagulation factors which it inhibits are going to be serine proteases. So the way they got serpin is they took the sir from serine, they took the p from protease, okay, so they took this from protease, and they took the in from inhibitor and got serpin. Okay, so thrombin is the first target that we've seen for antithrombin-3, which has been activated. Um, and thrombin is therefore a serine protease. All of the enzymes which antithrombin-3 inhibits are serine proteases. So thrombin is one of the obvious targets of antithrombin-3, but it also has other targets. It also inhibits factor 9A, Okay, so here are the Roman numerals for 9A, and I'll show you these on the intrinsic pathway in a moment. It also inhibits 10A, okay, and then also 11A, so here's 11A, and finally also 12A. So it inhibits quite a few of the coagulation factors once they're in the active form, and all of these are serine proteases, active serine proteases once they've been activated. Okay, right. So, let's just have a little bit of a revision of the coagulation cascades, because we did these quite a while ago now in this video. So, um, where are my pictures? Okay, so here is the intrinsic coagulation cascade. So, which of the members in this cascade is the antithrombin-3 going to inhibit? Well, it's going to inhibit 12A over here. So remember, this was the one that, what, that was activated by collagen, which was exposed. It's going to inhibit 11A, which is the uh, one activated by 12A. It's going to inhibit 9A, and it's also going to inhibit 10A. And finally, it's also going to inhibit thrombin down here. So it pretty much inhibits every single protein on all of the levels. Um, so if any of them become active within the bloodstream, antithrombin-3 is going to bind to them and stop them from working. In addition, if we look at the intrinsic, sorry, the extrinsic coagulation cascade, we look at the members on this that it inhibits. Remember, the extrinsic coagulation cascade was activated by tissue factor, which converted 7 to 7A, and then 7A converted 10 to 10A. Now, we know that 10A will be inhibited by our uh, antithrombin-3. 10A was then meant to uh, form a protein complex with 5A, its cofactor, and that protein complex was then meant to uh, activate prothrombin to thrombin. And if by some horrible mistake uh, the 10A survives and manages to bind to 5A and convert prothrombin to thrombin, then antithrombin-3 will inhibit the thrombin. Now, it's fair to say that the main target of antithrombin-3 is thrombin. It's the one that it inhibits the most effectively. Right, okay. So, this obviously has anticoagulative effects. It's going to stop coagulation from occurring. It's going to stop the conversion of fibrinogen into fibrin and fibrin into fibrin strands. So it's going to stop the formation of these fibrin strands within uh, the blood. So how can we make use of this in uh, antithrombotic therapy, okay? Well, we can give the drug heparin, okay? And heparin is a polysaccharide, just like heparan sulfate. In fact, very like heparan sulfate. Heparin and heparan sulfate are both what are known as glycosaminoglycans. 
glycase, which is a type of polysaccharide. So they are both what are known as glycosaminoglycans. Okay, if you want to know more about what that actually means, I have an entire video in the playlist on uh, inflammation and angiogenesis, uh, which has, um, which is all about antifrombin free. And in that video, I discuss uh, what a, the structure of a glycosaminoglycan is and how heparin is different from heparan sulfate. It's a long story, basically, so I can't really um, go into it here. Okay, because this video is already long enough. Uh, so, um, heparin is basically another one of these polysaccharides that is under this tag, glycosaminoglycans. And basically, it's similar to heparan sulfate, and it can also bind to antifrombin-3 here and activate it. So, if you give someone heparin, then it will go into their blood and it will bind to the antifrombin-3 from the liver. Okay, so here's antifrombin-3, AT3, and it will then activate that antifrombin-3, and this will inactivate then all of these serine proteases that we've seen before. So it will inhibit 2A, which is the shorthand for thrombin, okay? It will inhibit 9A, 10A, 11A, and 12A. And through these actions, uh, it will stop the intrinsic and extrinsic coagulation cascades if they should be activated, okay? Uh, so, if you don't have those cascades going on within the bloodstream, then you can't produce fibrin strands. And that means that you can't form a thrombus, basically, because thrombus is required coagulation. Remember that if you just make have the plate that's aggregating, if you just have plate that's aggregating, that doesn't form a solid mass. It forms a gooey mass that can easily disintegrate into nothing. Okay, so to hold it all together, you need the fibrin strands to be formed. And if you can't make fibrin strands, then you're not going to get the formation of a thrombus, and therefore you're going to be protected from the horrors that occur due to thrombosis, namely heart attack and stroke. Okay, so that's heparin now. Now we're going to go on to another very famous anticoagulant. Okay, we're going to talk about warfarin. Okay, so what does warfarin do? Well, to understand what warfarin does, we need to tell a story. We need to tell a story about these coagulation factors and the, a certain requirement of these coagulation factors. They require a very odd amino acid within their structure. And basically, warfarin is going to stop the production of this um, amino acid. Okay, right. So... Which amino acid do uh, they require? Well, they require gamma carboxyglutamate. Okay, so let me show you the structure of the normal glutamic acid molecule, and then I'll show you the structure of gamma carboxyglutamic acid. Okay, so the normal structure of glutamic acid is that you have, well, we'll start off with the plain old structure of an amino acid. So here is the amino group, the alpha carbon, and then down here you have the carboxylic acid group. Okay, then off the alpha carbon you have a hydrogen atom, and then you have the R group of glutamic acid, which is two methylene groups followed by a uh, carboxylic acid group. Okay, so this is the normal structure of glutamic acid, and I think I'll just tell you about what the difference between glutamic acid and glutamate is, just briefly. Okay, so glutamic acid is called glutamic acid for a reason, and that's because it's an acid. So what is an acid? Well, an acid is a molecule that's capable of donating a proton away, okay? And specifically, it's capable of donating this proton off this carboxylic acid group on the R group. And you might ask, well, why isn't this carboxylic acid group capable of donating a uh, proton away? And I would say it is, but usually in proton, uh, sorry, usually in proteins, we don't worry about that because this carboxylic acid group won't be intact. It will be within an amide link. Okay, so we'll consider this as our main carboxylic acid group. 
So basically, this carboxylic acid group is capable of donating that proton away, which will leave the oxygen with a negative charge. The molecule, when you now have a negative charge there, and no proton, the deprotonated molecule, is known as glutamate. Okay, so that's the strict difference between glutamic acid and glutamate. Glutamate is what's known as the conjugate base of glutamic acid. Because if you think about it, once you've removed the proton of this uh, alcohol group here, you'll have an oxygen with a negative charge, and this now won't be able to, you know, this molecule isn't going to be able to donate any more protons. So it's certainly not an acid anymore. Instead, it's actually a base, because bases are chemical species which are capable of receiving protons, which this negatively charged oxygen is very good at doing. Okay, so it's what's known as the conjugate base of glutamic acid. So all the acids have a conjugate base, which is the form, which is the molecule once it's donated away its proton. Okay, so glutamate is just the conjugate base of glutamic acid. Now, uh, of course, if you have a glutamic acid molecule that will be continually donating its proton away and turning into a glutamate molecule, then it'll continue to get its proton back and become a glutamic acid molecule again. So it's continually in a state of flux between moving between one and the other state. So that's why people use these two names interchangeably, because really the molecule will be interchanging between the two. Okay, so that's just a little side um, deviance. Okay, so now let me tell you about what this special amino acid that's going to be necessary for the synthesis of the of certain of the coagulation factors is. So gamma carboxy glutamic acid is what we need. Okay, so what does this mean? Well, we're basically going to stick a carboxyl group or a carboxylic acid group onto the R group of glutamate. Now, in order to understand what gamma means, we need to understand the naming of these carbons here. So this is the alpha carbon of the amino acid. This then, following the Greek alphabet, is the beta carbon. And this finally is the gamma carbon. So to create gamma carboxyglutamate, or gamma carboxyglutamic acid, they're the same thing as I've just discussed. Um, basically, you just stick another carboxylic acid group off this gamma carbon. So this is the structure of gamma carboxyglutamic acid. Okay, so here is our amino group again. Here is our alpha carbon. Here is our uh, carboxylic acid group that's core, that's the um, core carboxylic acid group. It's essential, and it's there in all amino acids. Okay, then we have our beta carbon, which just still has hydrogens off it. And now we have our gamma carbon here, which already had one carboxylic acid group off here, but now it's going to have another carboxylic acid group off it here. So this amino acid is not a normal amino acid, basically. And what you're going to have to do is synthesize a because you're not, you're not going to be able to put this protein, this amino acid in when you're actually creating a protein, because there aren't any tRNAs which will bind to gamma carboxyglutamic acid. So what you do is you synthesize the protein first, and then you modify the glutamic acid molecules, or the glutamic acid R groups, to put this extra carboxylic acid group in, so that the protein now has these gamma carboxyglutamic acid molecules in. So there is let me repeat this, there is no tRNA which this will attach to. This is not a normal amino acid. Instead, what you do is you incorporate this one into the protein, and then after the protein's been synthesized, you'll make a post-translational modification where you'll stick this carboxylic acid group onto uh, the R groups of glutamic acid. Okay, and this modification of glutamic acid to gamma carboxyglutamic acid is essential for the synthesis of certain of uh, the coagulation factors, okay? And it's carried out by the enzyme gamma glutamyl carboxylase, okay? So gamma glutamyl carboxylase. Okay, right. So in order to understand how warfarin works, 
we need to understand how this enzyme is going to work, what, how is it actually going to add this carboxylic acid group on, because unfortunately it would be lovely if it was nice and simple and warfarin just inhibited this enzyme, it's not that simple, it's a more convoluted mechanism than that, more subtle, so we'll um, continue this discussion of warfarin in the next video.